Pugachev's rebellion of 1773-75 was the principal revolt in a series of popular rebellions that took place in Russia after Catherine II seized power. In 1762, it began as an organized insurrection of Yate Cossacks headed by Yemelian Pugachev, a disaffected ex-lieutenant of the Russian Imperial Army, against a background of profound peasant unrest and war with the Ottoman Empire. After the initial success, Pugachev assumed leadership of an alternative government in the name of the assassinated Tsar Peter III and proclaimed an end to serfdom. This organized leadership presented a challenge to the imperial administration of Catherine II. The rebellion managed to consolidate support from various groups including the peasants, the Cossacks, and old believers priesthood. At one point, its administration claimed control over most of the territory between the Volga River and the Urals. One of the most significant events of the insurrection was the Battle of Kazan in July 1774. Government forces failed to respond effectively to the insurrection at first, partly due to logistical difficulties and a failure to appreciate its scale. But the revolt was crushed towards the end of 1774 by General Michelson at Tsaritsyn. Pugachev was captured soon after and executed in Moscow in January 1775. Further reprisals against rebel areas were carried out by General Peter Panin. The events have generated many stories in legend and literature, most notably Pushkin's historical novel The Captain's Daughter. It was the largest peasant revolt in Russia's history, background and aims. As the Russian monarchy contributed to the degradation of the serfs, peasant anger ran high. Peter the Great ceded entire villages to favored nobles, while Catherine the Great confirmed the authority of the nobles over the serfs in return for the nobler political cooperation. The unrest intensified as the 18th century wore on, with more than 50 peasant revolts occurring between 1762 and 1769. These culminated in Pugachev's rebellion, when, between 1773 and 1775, Yemeli and Pugachev rallied the peasants and Cossacks and promised the serfs land of their own and freedom from their lords. There were various pressures on Russian serfs during the 18th century, which induced him to follow Pugachev. The peasantry in Russia were no longer bound to the land, but tied to their owner. The connecting links that had existed, which had been diminishing in form between the peasant community and the Tsar broke by the interposition of the serf owners. These private lords or agents of the church or state blocked access to the political authority. Many nobles returned to their estates after 1762 and imposed harsher rules on their peasants. The peasants felt abandoned by the modern state. They were living in difficult circumstances and had no way to change their situation. The relationship between peasant and ruler was cut off most dramatically during the 18th century. The decree of 1767 completely prohibited direct petitions to the empress from the peasantry. The peasants were also subject to an increase in indirect taxes due to the increase in the state's requirements. In addition, a strong inflationary trend resulted in higher prices on all goods. There were natural disasters in Russia during the 18th century, which also added strain on the peasants. Frequent recurrence of crop failures, plagues and epidemics created instability. The most dramatic was the 1771 epidemic in Moscow, which brought to the surface all the unconscious and unfocused fears and panics of the populace. Each ruler altered the position of the church which created more pressure. Peter the Great gave the church new obligations, while its administration assimilated to a department of the secular state. The church's resources, or the means of collection, could not meet the new obligations and as a consequence, they heavily exploited and poorly administered their serfs. The unrest spurred constant revolt among church serfs. Leadership and Strategy Pugachev's image according to folk memory and contemporary legends was one of a pretender liberator. He had not resisted his overthrow, but had left to wander the world. He had come to help the revolt, but he did not initiate it. According to popular myth, the Cossacks and the people did that. 
The popular mythology of Peter III linked Pugachev with the Emancipation Manifesto of 1762 and the serfs' expectations of further liberalizations had. He continued as ruler. Pugachev offered freedom from the poll tax and the recruit levy, which made him appear to follow in the same vein as the emperor he was impersonating. Pugachev attempted to reproduce the St. Petersburg bureaucracy. He established his own college of war with quite extensive powers and functions. It is important to emphasize that he did not promise complete freedom from taxation and recruitment for the peasants, he granted only temporary relief. His perception of the state was one where soldiers took the role of Cossacks, meaning they were free, permanent, military servicemen. Pugachev placed all other military personnel into this category as well, even the nobles and officers who joined his ranks. All peasants were seen as servants of the state, they were to become state peasants and serve as Cossacks in the militia. Pugachev envisioned the nobles returning to their previous status as the Tsar's servicemen on salary instead of estate and serf owners. He emphasized the peasants' freedom from the nobility. Pugachev still expected the peasants to continue their labor, but he granted them the freedom to work and own the land. They would also enjoy religious freedoms and Pugachev promised to restore the bond between the ruler and the people, eradicating the role of the noble as the intermediary. Under the guise of Peter III, Pugachev built up his own bureaucracy and army which copied that of Catherine's. Some of his top commanders took on the pseudonyms of dukes and courtiers. Zerubin Chaika, Pugachev's top commander, for example, took the guise of Zaka Chernyshev. The army Pugachev established, at least at the very top levels of command, also mimicked that of Catherine's. He built up his own war college and a fairly sophisticated intelligence network of messengers and spies. Even though Pugachev was illiterate, he recruited the help of local priests, mullahs, and stashans to write and disseminate his royal decrees, or ukases in Russian and Tatar languages. These ukazi were copied, sent to villages and read to the masses by the priests and mullahs. In these documents, he begged the masses to serve him faithfully. For example, an excerpt from a ukasha written in late 1773. From me, such reward and investiture will be with money and bread compensation and with promotions. And a you, as well as your next of kin will have a place in my government and will be designated to serve a glorious duty on my behalf. If there are those who forget their obligations to their natural ruler Peter III, and dare not carry out the command that my devoted troops are to receive weapons in their hands, then they will see for themselves my righteous anger, and will then be punished harshly. Recruitment and Support From the very beginning of the insurgency, Pugachev's generals carried out mass recruitment campaigns in Tatar and Bashka settlements, with the instructions of recruiting one member from every or every other household and as many weapons as they could secure. He recruited not only Cossacks but Russian peasants and factory workers, Tatars, Bashkirs, Chuvish. Famous Bashka hero Salawat Yulayev joined him. Pugachev's primary target for his campaign was not the people themselves, but their leaders. He recruited priests and mullahs to disseminate his decrees and read them to the masses as a way of lending them credence. Priests in particular were instrumental figures in carrying out Pugachev's propaganda campaigns. Pugachev was known to stage heroic welcomes whenever he entered a Russian village, in which he would be greeted by the masses as their sovereign. A few days before his arrival to a given city or village, messengers would be sent out to inform the priests and deacons in that town of his impending arrival. These messengers would request that the priests bring out salt and water and ring the church bells to signify his coming. The priests would also be instructed to read Pugachev's manifestos during Mass and sing prayers to the health of the great Emperor Peter III. Most priests, although not all, complied with Pugachev's requests. Zobev, believing in the slander-ridden decree of the villainous impostor, brought by the villainous Ataman Loshkarev, read it publicly before the people in church. 
and when that atom in brought his band, consisting of 100 men, to their Baikar love village, then that Zabev met them with a cross and with icons and chanted prayers in the church, and then at the time of service, as well as after, evokes the name of the Emperor Peter III for suffrage. Pugachev's army was composed of a diverse mixture of disaffected peoples in southern Russian society most notably Cossacks, Bashkirs, homesteaders, religious dissidents and industrial serfs. Pugachev was very much in touch with the local population's needs and attitudes. He was a Don Cossack and encountered the same obstacles as his followers. It is noticeable that Pugachev's forces always took routes that reflected the very regional and local concerns of the people making up his armies. For example, after the very first attack on Yask, he turned not towards the interior, but instead turned east towards Orenburg which for most Cossacks was the most direct symbol of Russian oppression. The heterogeneous population in Russia created special problems for the government, and it provided opportunities for those opposing the state and seeking support among the discontented, as yet unassimilated natives. Each group of people had problems with the state, which Pugachev focused on in order to gain their support. Non-Russians, such as the Bashkirs, followed Pugachev because they were promised their traditional ways of life, freedom of their lands, water and woods, their faith and laws, food, clothing, salaries, weapons and freedom from ensuffment. Cossacks were similarly promised their old ways of life, the rights to the river Iike from source to sea, tax-free pasturage, free salt, 12 chetvi of corn and 12 rubles per Cossack per year. Pugachev found ready support among the Udnovortsi, in the westernmost part of the region swept by the Pugachev rebellion, the right bank of the middle Volga, there were a number of Udnovortsi. These were descendants of petty military servicemen who had lost their military function and declined to the status of small, but free, peasants who tilled their own lands. Many of them were also old believers, so they felt particularly alienated from the state established by Peter the Great. They were hard-pressed by landowners from central provinces who were acquiring the land in their area and settling their serfs on it. These homesteaders pinned their hopes on the providential leader who promised to restore their former function and status. The network of old believer holy men and hermitages served to propagandize the appearance of Pugachev as Peter III and his successors, and they also helped him recruit his first followers among the old believer Cossack of the Iike. The II Cossack host was most directly and completely involved in the Pugachev revolt. Most of its members were old believers who had settled among the Iike River, now Ural River. The Cossacks opposed the tide of rational modernization and the institutionalization of political authority. They regarded their relationship to the ruler as a special and personal one, based on their voluntary service obligations. In return, they expected the Tsar's protection of their religion, traditional social organization, and administrative autonomy. They followed the promises of Pugachev and raised the standard of revolt in the hope of recapturing their previous special relationship and securing the government's respect for their social and religious traditions. Factory workers supported Pugachev because their situation had worsened. Many state-owned factories had been turned over to private owners, which intensified exploitation. These private owners stood as a barrier between the workers and the government. They inhibited appeals to the state for improvement of conditions. Also, with the loss of Russia's competitive advantage on the world market, the production of the Ural mines and iron smelting factories declined. This decline hit the workers the hardest because they had no other place to go or no other skill to market. There was enough material to support rebellion against the system. By and large the factories supported Pugachev, some voluntarily continuing to produce artillery and ammunition for the rebels challenge to the Russian state. In 1773 Pugachev's army attacked Samara and occupied it. His greatest victory came with the taking of Kazan, by which time his captured territory stretched from the Volga to the Ural Mountains. 
Though fairly well organized for a revolt at the time, Pugachev's main advantage early on was the lack of seriousness about Pugachev's rebellion. Catherine the Great regarded the troublesome Cossack as a jerk and put a small bounty of about 500 rubles on his head. But by 1774, the threat was more seriously addressed. By November the bounty was over 28,000 rubles. The Russian general Michelson lost many men due to a lack of transportation and discipline among his troops. While Pugachev scored several important victories, even killing General and Chef Alexander Bibikov, Pugachev launched the rebellion in mid-September 1773. He had a substantial force composed of Cossacks, Russian peasants, factory serfs, and non-Russians with which he overwhelmed several outposts along the Iyag and early in October went into the capital of the region, Orenburg. While besieging this fortress, the rebels destroyed one government relief expedition and spread the revolt northward into the Urals, westward to the Volga, and eastward into Siberia. Pugachev's groups were defeated in late March and early April 1774 by a second relief corps under General Bibikov, but Pugachev escaped to the southern Urals, Baskiria, where he recruited new supporters. Then, the rebels attacked the city of Kazan, burning most of it on July 23, 1774. Though beaten three times at Kazan by Tsarist troops, Pugachev escaped by the Volga, and gathered new forces as he went down the west bank of the river capturing main towns. On September 5, 1774, Pugachev failed to take Tsaritsyn and was defeated in the steppe below that town. His closest followers betrayed him to the authorities. After a prolonged interrogation, Pugachev was publicly executed in Moscow on January 21, 1775.